Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 2023 Musa J. Arman Colloquium, Science and Innovation. My name is Miguel Garcia Garibay. I'm the Dean of the Division of Physical Sciences, uh, and currently also the Senior Dean of the College of Letters and Sciences. Uh, but today I'm here really much more in my role of uh, Dean of the Division of Physical Sciences, a fellow member of the Divi Division of Physical Sciences. I'm a member of the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Uh, and for those of you who are visitors and might not know, the Division of Physical Sciences actually comprises six departments, in addition to the Department of Physics and Astronomy that we celebrate here today, today with this lecture, and my own department, Chemistry and Biochemistry. We have the Departments of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences, the Department of Earth, Planetary, and Space Sciences. We have Mathematics, and we have Statistics. We also host the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability, which is uh, one of the most interdisciplinary enterprises in our campus. So, um, physical sciences really has a tradition of uh, excellence in research and education. We all know that you know, our colleagues in physics and astronomy and the rest of the division are amazing scientists who have pushed the frontiers of science in every possible direction. But not, not everybody knows that uh, our, our faculty are really amazing teachers also that really bring education to, to different levels. So some of our colleagues are really are award-winning uh, teachers and really are pushing you know, the, the, the frontiers of education uh, in ways that you can only do in a research university, uh, which I think is, is uh, really special. Now, the Department of Physics and Astronomy, of course, is home to 2020 Nobel Laureate of Physics, Professor Andrea Guess, who's joining us today, uh, as well as uh, many top scientists leading in the way of, uh, in many thrilling areas. We have uh, a very strong groups. If, if there is an area of physics and astronomy, you name it, and uh, we have an amazing group of faculty. We, we, so let's say theoretical physics, quantum computing, plasma science, and of course, astrophysics. Um, now, one of the things that makes us extremely proud is the impressively high number of astronomers serving as PIs of early release science programs and cycle one programs with the James Webb uh, Space Telescope. Uh, department faculty have been named to the National Science Board fellows of distinguished institutions such as the American Astro Astronomical Society, the American Physic Physical Society, the National Academy of Science. There is really a lot to celebrate, and this is an incredible, incredibly exciting time to be in the field of physics and astronomy. This evening, we're very pleased, pleased to welcome Dr. Bruce McIntosh uh, as our Musa J. Arman Colloquium speaker. So before I turn over to Vice Chair for Astronomy and Astrophysics, Tomas Otreu, uh, to introduce Bruce, I would like to share a bit of insight into the Arman Colloquium. The Arman Colloquium series was created by a generous gift to the Department of Physics and Astronomy by the family of Musa Arman, a distinguished alumnus of our PhD program in physics and an eminent physicist and inventor who is known for advances the frontiers of elementary physics and experimental nuclear physics. As the subtitle of the lecture series, Science and Innovation, suggests, Musa Arman spent his life advancing the frontiers of physics in academia and in industry through his groundbreaking research. We are extremely grateful for this colloquium series, which welcomes visionary scientists like Dr. McIntosh, who embody the spirit of Dr. Arman through accomplishments that are something exceptional and out of the ordinary, based on their degrees in physics and astronomy. It is tremendously important for us to hear from, from and exchange ideas with experts from other institutions, such as Dr. McIntosh. Lectures like this uh, and so many other, other critically important aspects of what we do would not be possible without philanthropic support. I really want to highlight that. If what we did at UCLA were just that, what can be done with state support, none of us would be here today, and this building probably wouldn't exist. So thank you to so many of you 
for your steadfast support and thoughtful engagement in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. It makes a huge difference and is really much appreciated. And now we will hear from Professor and Vice Chair of Astronomy and Astrophysics, Tommaso Treo. Tommaso. Thanks, Miguel. So it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce today's speaker, Professor Bruce McIntosh. Bruce is currently the director of the University of California Observatories. This is a multi-campus research unit that manages and operates the ground-based telescopes of the University of California system, including the two 10-meter Keck telescopes, the largest optical infrared telescopes in the world, and Lick Observatory in Northern California. The multi-campus research unit includes UCLA and UCLA's infrared lab, which has built infrared instrumentation for the Keck and Lick observatories and has given a major contribution to keep UC astronomy at the forefront of astronomy worldwide. Bruce is a recognized leader in astronomy. In addition to his current role as director of UCO, Bruce has served on many important committees, including the steering committee of the Astro 2020 Decadal Survey organized by the National Academy of Science. Scientifically, Bruce is an expert in direct imaging of exoplanets. His paper on direct imaging of multiple planets orbiting the star HR8799 was recognized by the Newcomb Cleveland Prize of the American Association for the Advancement of Science as the best paper published in Science in 2008-2009. He served as principal investigator of the Gemini Planet Imager, a revolutionary instrument dedicated to direct imaging of exoplanets. Prior to joining UCO as director and professor of astronomy at UC Santa Cruz, Bruce was a professor at Stanford University and prior to that a physicist at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Importantly, after getting his PhD at UCLA as the first graduate of the infrared lab. So we are very proud that the first step of Bruce's illustrious career was taken at UCLA. Welcome home, Bruce. Thank you very much for the introduction and, and very much for the invitation. It is really exciting to, to be back here. Um, there are a handful of faculty who maybe still intimidate me slightly for my graduate days, but they know who they are and hopefully they won't abuse this power to, to ask me inappropriate questions during the talk. Um, let's see, wake up, advance slides. Oop, I have to do it this way, there we go. Um, uh, and yes, my new role is Director of University of California Observatories. My office is at UC Santa Cruz, but basically it's a job for the whole UC system. And one of the things I like about visits like this is the opportunity to go around to the campuses, especially ones like UCLA that play a critical role in, in keeping our telescopes and our observatories um, meaningfully competitive. And since this is a, a, a unique speaking opportunity, I decided to do the somewhat self-indulgent version of a historical overview. Um, starting somewhat before the beginning of my um, graduate career, around 1610, but covering the whole, whole field of studying extrasolar planets through imaging, which is one of the hardest, but also potentially the most exciting ways to study extrasolar planets, planetary systems orbiting around other stars. Um, also, because I'm doing this in Los Angeles, this will be slightly the Hollywood version, which means occasionally I'm gonna conflate the exact order that events came in in a way that makes the story more dramatic. So again, people who may remember the dates could, could avoid um, calling me on that because we want the narrative to come together in a, a coherent um, gel in a coherent fashion. Um, even before the 60, we'll see why 1610 is important in a bit, but first I'm gonna move backwards in time. Again, prequels, you know, narrative styles. Um, but this question about other worlds, about other planets is something that has fascinated philosophers and scientists back to the point when there was not a distinction between philosophers and scientists. The way Albertus Magnus phrased this question, do there exist many worlds or is there but a single world? One of the most noble and exalted questions in the study of nature. Not long afterwards, we knew part of the answer to that. We knew that there were planets. We knew that the earth was not different than the lights in the sky, but that they were physical objects like the one we're standing on. But it wasn't until much later if we knew there were other systems of planets, that we knew that our solar system was not unique. And discoveries during my professional career made by many of my colleagues have taught us, in fact, that we are not unique, that there are thousands, millions of solar systems out there. But in other ways, we may be unique. All those solar systems are extremely different than our own. And whether solar systems like our own exist, still we don't quite have a handle. 
And on the ultimate question, the way Albert almost certainly meant it, are there planets like Earth that you can walk around on that have life on them? We don't know the answer to that right now, but we might. I'll show at the end how we know how to build the instruments that could answer that question, that could bring us to the final conclusion of finding either that there are life-bearing worlds nearby in our galaxy or that life-bearing worlds are so rare that the Earth is effectively unique. And either of those would be a transformative discovery for humans and for our, our civilization. So we'll go back even a little bit further to sort of pre-Ptolemaic um, um, times. And then, if you, know, if you studied astronomy then, it was actually fairly simple. There was the Earth, and there was everything that wasn't the Earth, and everything that wasn't the Earth went around the Earth, which is a nice natural worldview. Obviously, we're the most important thing there is. We must be the center of everything. Um, things should move in a, a nice Earth-centric way. And of course, that turned out to be a bad model um, for the, though it's psychologically satisfying, it was very bad at doing things like predicting where Mars was going to be next week, which may not seem like a very important question, but is an astrophysics question. Can you produce a model that will tell you how the universe is going to evolve? And that model, that question was solved by sort of the first astrophysicist astronomer team up, Tycho, who was an astronomer who made painstaking observations of where Mars was night after, or paid people to make painstaking observations, the equivalent of graduate students at the time, night after night after night of where Mars was, building up a database of observations, and Kepler, who was an astrophysicist, though they didn't have the words at the time, who produced the model that said, well, maybe the planets are going around the sun, and maybe they're going around the sun in elliptical orbits obeying certain laws, and that will let me tell you where Mars is going to be over the next week, month, year. That will produce a model that was better than the model that um, Ptolemy had. Um, and these, this collaborative work really was what nailed the idea that we're not the center of the universe, the heliocentric model in which, in their mind, the sun was the center of the universe. And that was a compelling demonstration to scientists but there was another piece of that, that revolution in realizing the Earth wasn't the center of the universe, and that was imaging. That was Galileo. Again, on the astronomer, almost to the instrument builder side, which is, is where UCLA has a fine tradition, he didn't build the first telescope, but he was one of the first people to point a telescope up in the sky and write down what he saw. One of the first things he did was look at Jupiter, because you always look at Jupiter. Um, and when he looked there, he saw next to Jupiter, let me get that to run, there we go slightly glitchy, the first time he looked at Jupiter, he saw four stars next to it. He said, well, that's kind of odd. Why would there be four stars next to Jupiter? And then he looked at it the next night, and there were four stars next to Jupiter, but they were in different positions. And he looked the next night after that, and there were four stars next to Jupiter, night after night, but they were in different places. Even as Jupiter itself moved, they were following Jupiter, but moving independently. And of course, now we know, but he figured out, those were moons. Those were the first four moons of Jupiter, the first moons orbiting an object other than the Earth that was ever found. And this beautiful video from the planetarium in Milan illustrates the, the transition between his notebooks and what we now know to be true. And this, in, other, in some ways, was the other compelling piece of evidence that we weren't the center of the universe. There were other objects out there being orbited themselves by their own systems of satellites. Everything didn't just revolve around the Earth. And it's interesting to note that that the math and the astrophysics didn't actually really get in trouble with the author religious authorities of the time. It was really the, because maybe they couldn't understand the math and the astrophysics. It was being able to look through a telescope and see something different than you expected that, that created a, a crisis in our faith and view of the universe. Also, maybe that Galileo was a bit of a jerk. I'm not 100% um, um, sure about that. Um, and it's a really bad sign when scientists compare themselves to Galileo, so we're not doing that here. But there is something compelling about actually seeing an image of something as opposed to just seeing the mathematics underlying it, and that's one of the cool things about extrasolar planets. So now, at the time they were doing this, we had a solar system with um, five planets up until they realized the Earth was a planet, um, and then we had six. When I was in graduate school, we had nine planets, decided that was too many or not enough, depending on who you ask, and so we've moved back to a solar system with eight planets. Um, uh, and an interesting thing that's maybe the last part of this, are we, uh, are we the center of the universe, is to the extent that I was taught anything about planets, which really I wasn't, because it wasn't an active field of research at the time, the expectation was that every solar system we would discover would look like this that there was a universal process that produced solar systems, produced us, 
everybody else has to be like us, that the Earth has to be the, the archetype of other solar systems. And spoilers, that turns out not to be true, that that was one last piece of a view that, that this process we understand here must be exactly the same as everyone else's process. And so transitioning a little bit into numbers, I just want to remind people of astronomer units. So there, there are cliches about astronomers always talk about 137 million miles or 4 billion miles to Pluto. None of us do that. I have no idea how many miles it is to Pluto. What astronomers do is we invent our own units so that we only have to remember numbers with two or three digits in them. And so the unit we've invented for solar systems is called the astronomical unit. It does what it says on the tin which is the si distance from the Earth to the Sun. And I can remember the distance from the Earth to the Sun in astronomical units, because it's one. Distance to Jupiter in astronomical units, five. Saturn is about 10, all the way out to the edges of the solar system, about 100. So we invent yardsticks that are convenient for measuring what we want to measure. Um, and I will use that unit when I am talking about other solar systems rather than zillion billion miles or anything like that. And I did negotiate to see that I was allowed to show a couple of graphs, so we'll, we'll have some graphs like this, because every exoplanet talk has to have a version of this graph. What this graph shows is planets in this direction, the y-axis are their mass. Big massive planets like Jupiter, small planets like Earth. And I've again cheated, I have no idea how many kilograms the Earth weighs, I know how many Earth masses the Earth weighs, one. So I'm using the Earth as my, yard, as my standard of weight for planets. Down here, orbital separation, call it semi-major axis, in astronomical units, so Earth is one, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune sitting up here. This is what life was like when I entered graduate school, and I put the y-axis here to cut off Pluto so that we wouldn't have to even have the argument about whether it counts or not. And you can see on that diagram, but also in this artist's conception, that there are two kinds of planets in our solar system. There's big giant planets, that turn out to be mostly made out of gas, hydrogen, methane, things like that, maybe with rocky, icy cores in the center, mostly gas on the outside. And then there's small planets, we call them terrestrial planets, that are rock and metal with relatively thin atmospheres and solid surfaces, surfaces you can actually stand on like we're standing in the room. And like I said, kind of the expectation when I was in graduate school was that this is what the process that formed planets had to do this. It had to form giant planets on the outside, rocky planets on the inside, that's all you could find. And that expectation actually discouraged people to some extent from looking for planets, A, because it's hard, but it's really hard to look for little planets and really hard to look for planets that are far away from their star. And so only a small number of groups were brave enough to look for planets that didn't fit within this paradigm. And that group, those groups, though, succeeded. The first way they found them was not by seeing planets, but by seeing what they do to the stars. So, if you have a planet orbiting a star, we talk about the Earth orbiting the Sun, that's not quite what happens. Really, they both orbit around a common point, the center of mass of the system. The star's gravity pulls the planet, the planet's gravity pulls the star, the two of them go around like this. And even if you couldn't see the planet, you could see the motion of the star in a way that would tell you there was something invisible whose gravity was pulling it. You can measure those motions very precisely, primarily through measurements of Doppler shifts of the change in light from the star due to its motion. And that was the first modulo some arguments about some things involving pulsars, the first discoveries of things that we unambiguously recognize as extrasolar planets. So just after I graduated by about a year, this diagram started to be filled in. By a few years later, more and more were discovered through this Doppler technique. And you'll already see this expectation that they'd be like our solar system didn't hold true. These are planets as big as Jupiter, but some of them were orbiting closer to their star than Mercury, practically grazing the surface of their star. Nothing like we expected to exist. And of course, when these came out, there were beautiful artist conceptions. Here's a planet. It looks just like Jupiter, obviously. It's got a moon that's evaporating. It's so close to its star. Wouldn't that be amazing? You know, that's not what we really saw. What we saw was something that Kepler would have recognized. We saw a bunch of points measurements of velocities rather than positions that you would fit a model to, but that tell you there's a planet there through physics. Their willingness to do this, um, of course, got Mayor and Kalos the Nobel Prize, not so much because of the physics, which is easy, but because of their willingness to believe in their data, that the objects that they were seeing that no one expected were actually real, um, unambiguously deserved the Nobel Prize. As I said, we have these press releases, but but really, all you know is there's a thing there. You know how much mass it has because you've measured its gravity. That's it. You don't really know that it's Jupiter-like and it's got evaporating moons and so on. 
Um, and as I said, the, compared to our solar system where planets go around in years, the first one they found goes around in four days and a bunch more were discovered, incredibly different than our solar system. Um, the second way that extrasolar planets are routinely found and now the most common, again, is not seeing the planet so much as seeing its shadow. So if you have a planet orbiting around a star, as in this video, um, if it happens to pass in front of the star, it will block the starlight. One of the notable things about planets is they're mostly opaque. And so the star will get very slightly fainter for a few hours because there's a planet in the way, and then get brighter again a few hours later. The amount by which it gets fainter, brighter and fainter is small, about a percent for a planet the size of Jupiter, but that's actually not that hard a measurement to make with modern digital cameras. You can literally do this in your backyard if you're a careful backyard astronomer, and people have done this with, with amateur size um, telescopes. Of course, for it to happen, you have to get incredibly lucky. The planet has to be actually between you and the star. If the planet's doing this, you won't get to see it. So if you want to find a lot of these, you need to look at 100,000 stars, which is harder to do in your backyard. But it's done by a mix of small survey telescopes and big NASA missions that can stare at 100,000 stars at a time. Before the big NASA missions, just a handful of planets were found with this transiting technique. But it's sufficiently sensitive, it can see quite small planets as long as they're close to their star. And so early on, more Jupiter-like planets were found, more and more smaller planets were found, approaching, though not quite reaching, the equivalent of planets of Earth, planets the size of Earth. And in fact, a lot of what they found were planets that were bigger than the Earth, but smaller than the giant planets, maybe 50% or twice the size of the Earth. And we're not incredibly imaginative. We called them super-Earths, also because that sounds more exciting than what you could also call them, which might be mini Neptunes. And again, they have their press releases. This one actually has continents and clouds on it. It looks deserty, I guess, because it doesn't seem to have oceans. Very exciting. Don't know that. We just know how big the thing is. And in our heads, that produces a picture that it's Earth-like. But again, maybe that's reflecting our view that we are the universal experience. Maybe they aren't super Earths. Maybe they are miniature versions of Neptune. And so the list of what we know about planets is very long, but there's a lot we don't know. The, these discoveries of systems that are very different than our own has complicated the process of producing a model of planet formation. And there's not really a single simple consensus model that can explain every extrasolar planet we see, which might be OK. Maybe the answer is there are multiple ways you can form planets. There are different pathways that planet formation takes. Sometimes you get systems with giant Jupiters grazing the star. Sometimes you get Earths you can walk around on. So is there a single universal process, or are there many pathways? Are solar systems like our own rare? Solar systems like our own are right on the edge of our ability to detect, and so we can't really answer that question right now. The transit and Doppler techniques, although they're very powerful, only really work when the planet's close to the star, because it's got to get in the way or it's got to have enough gravity. So what's going on in the outer parts of solar systems, where Saturn is, where Uranus and Neptune are? We don't really, don't really have a complete inventory. These objects we like to call super-Earths, are they really just big rocky things like Earth, or do they have some completely different history? Maybe they used to be like Neptune, a big gassy planet, and they got their atmosphere blown off by being too close to their star. Um, of the little planets, there's some that we're pretty sure are made out of rock, but are they made out of rock and still have an atmosphere like the Earth does? Not too much atmosphere, not too little atmosphere. Can those planets host life? And then finally, the, the holy grail question, is there a life-bearing extrasolar planet in our neighborhood? So answering this, the techniques we can use, one is to study the planets in more detail to see what they're composed of. As in our solar system, the sun, mostly hydrogen and helium, and a tiny little bit of other stuff. Astronomers call everything else metals, but we'll just call it other stuff. Jupiter um, is close, but not exactly the same as the sun. It's still mostly hydrogen, mostly helium, but it's got about three times as much other stuff, as far as we can tell, compared to the sun. It's enhanced in the heavy stuff, in the form of things like methane and water and carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide, and probably deep in its core, rock and heavier elements. The other giant planets are still mostly hydrogen and helium, but even more enhanced in other stuff. We know this because we can study them remotely and because we can cheat and actually send spacecraft and drop them down in the planets to see what they're made out of. And we think that's a clue to how planets formed. But meanwhile, planets like the Earth, not mostly hydrogen and helium, the Earth has a tiny bit of hydrogen, the Earth has essentially no helium for all practical purposes, certainly no original helium, about 99.99% other stuff. 
So something that formed planets made them branch, made them take different pathways to either form giant ones or planets you can stand on. Although we don't know how planets form, we do know where they form. When you have a young star, it's usually surrounded by a disk of gas and dust. In this sort of stylized cartoon, there's a disk of gas of material that's kind of the same material as the star, but mixed in it are solid things, dusty grains or icy grains. Close to the star, the solid things are grains made out of rock. Some of my animations are not working. Ah, lost some colors, oh well. This color is supposed to indicate rocky grains. This color indicates grains covered with water ice, and then there's also grains covered with carbon dioxide ice. And so when you form a planet, what you get probably depends on what ratio you mix these ingredients in. If I just form a planet by scooping up a huge chunk of the disk, I'll end up with the same ratio of material as the sun does. But if I season it, if I add extra solid material, I could end up like Jupiter does, with a little bit more heavy elements, because the solid material holds the heavy stuff. And then if I go all out and don't bother adding any gas, you could end up with something like the Earth that's all heavy elements. There's a planet like Jupiter. It might form a core of solid elements, get some other solid elements in its atmosphere that would then dissolve. Complicating these things, we now realize planets move around. They might not be located where they originally formed. And then a planet like the Earth somehow didn't get any hydrogen gas and just became a nice rocky planet. So for our solar system, we can drop spacecraft in them. That's easy. For other objects, we have to study them remotely through spectroscopy. Again, science audience, I'm allowed to talk about things like that. You know, if you shine light through a cloud of gas, the elements and molecules and compounds in the cloud of gas like to absorb specific wavelengths of light. And so rather than a rainbow of light, you get a rainbow with colors missing, where particular wavelengths of light have been absorbed. Absorption spectroscopy, we call it. You can visualize that as a rainbow with missing colors, or the other kind of graph I'm allowed to use you can make a plot of how intense the light is versus the wavelength of light from blue to red, and there's lots of light except at wavelengths where the atoms ate particular individual photons, and you don't see as much. And planets, in, under various configurations, are basically clouds of gas or planets' atmospheres with light shining through them. And so we can use this spectroscopy technique to measure what planets are made out of. That's been done on very large scale for these transiting planets, Conveniently, they pass in front of the star, a big light source. Light shines through their atmospheres, and you see whether, whether you see these absorption features. It's been done for a lot of transiting planets with somewhat inconsistent results. The compositions vary a lot from kind of Jupiter-like to star-like to more Earth-like, but still with a lot of hydrogen in their atmosphere. Um, but we don't know. Almost certainly, these planets are not where they were originally formed, or many of them have probably moved around. We don't know if their atmospheres have been modified by being too close to their star. We don't really have perfect clues as to the conditions they form under. So one clue to how planets form, and ultimately the question of whether you can get Earths, would be to measure more of their compositions. And the other thing that would be a clue is demographics, the fractions of planets where they live in this diagram. This is the 2004 version, and you can see kind of an all the planets are concentrated here. There's an absence of Saturns and Uranuses and Neptunes. But if you're used to the way scientists think and show graphs, you might guess that that's not real, that what that really represents is just the limit of our sensitivity. Planets out here are just too small to see with Doppler shifts or transit techniques. Planets out here take too long to go around their sun, and so you can't see them with these techniques. They don't line up right. And so, as of 2004, we didn't really have any way to probe the outer parts of solar systems, the place where Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune live. And again, that might be a clue, the demographics of planets to how they form. And so finally, getting to what I'm supposed to be talking about, direct imaging, that's a way to try and address these different techniques. With direct imaging now, we can measure the composition of some planets and get clues as to maybe not the only planet formation pathways, but some other planet formation pathways. It's especially good at studying the outer parts of solar systems. I'll talk about why, but, but it lets us probe things you can't do with the other techniques. And in turn, that can inform questions as to whether systems like our own are rare or not. In the future, and I'll talk about this at the end, we might bring this technique to bear on the small rocky planets, and we might have the chance to learn, can they host life, and is there a life-bearing planet in our immediate neighborhood or not? OK, so direct imaging, why is it hard? Um, it's hard because planets kind of small and faint, and stars are really bright. The, the analogy that I'm required by the extrasolar planet union to use 
is that it's like there's a lighthouse. You're looking at a lighthouse from some distance away, and there's a firefly next to it. Um, fireflies turn out to be about a million times fainter than lighthouses, so it's about similar to the planets I'm going to be showing you, and you're looking at it from miles and miles away. It's surprisingly hard to see a firefly when it's next to a lighthouse. It's especially hard if you're doing it from the Earth, because the Earth has this atmosphere, very lovely from a life-bearing standpoint, not ideal from telescope standpoints. If you look at your star or your lighthouse, the atmosphere blurs it, and this is actually a high-speed movie looking at a single star of the way distortions in the Earth's atmosphere, turbulence, changes in temperature and density, cause us what should be a sharp point to turn into a big blurry blob. If you look at a planet in our solar system, this is Neptune, seen from a pretty good telescope on top of Mauna Kea from the Earth, you can't even really tell that it's round. It's been distorted enough by the atmosphere that you could believe me that there's a planet there, but, but not much more than that. Um, you can deal with that by launching telescopes into space, but I'm not going to talk too much about that in the, the first parts of the talk. One thing that University of California actually collectively has been a pioneer in is fixing that from the ground with a technology we call adaptive optics. So that takes a telescope. Here's a telescope. Modern telescopes use mirrors to focus light. And then you bounce that light off another mirror that's designed to change its shape. It's a thin piece of glass, about a millimeter thick, with little electrical actuators, piezoelectric materials behind it, that can bend the surface of the glass. Not by a lot, but by enough to correct for the way the atmosphere distorted the light. And then you have a sensor that measures these wave fronts of light, measures how they were distorted. Big computer to do, not that big a computer, but this big, to do the math to figure out how to convert that into shapes of the deformable mirror. And then you have to do it again every millisecond because the atmosphere doesn't hold still. Technologically challenging, but we've feasible, and with that, you can correct these atmospheric distortions and turn this image of Neptune into something like this. This is a Keck telescope adaptive optics image of Neptune. Um, unlike Galileo, we don't look at Jupiter because Jupiter's actually too big for our telescopes. Neptune is the modern equivalent. It's the first thing you always point your adaptive optic system at because it's pretty, and you can see lots of details, and it fits in the, in the telescope. It's tradition by now. Even the James Webb Space Telescope did that. Um, so we can get our telescopes almost as good as they would be in space. That'll make it easier to see the firefly, but still not enough. With the adaptive optics turned on, this is what a star looks like from the Keck telescope. Nice little point, very good. This is what the same star looks like if I overexpose it. If I let my camera look for a longer period of time, long enough that I could maybe see a planet, if it wasn't for the fact that the stars turned into this big messy blob. That's kind of the telescope equivalent of lens flare, basically. It's diffracted light from the edges of the telescope, imperfections in polishing, leftover atmospheric turbulence because our first-gen adaptive optic systems weren't perfect. These individual blobs are about 100 times brighter than an extrasolar planet. Excuse me, they're about a, a I want to make sure I get the math right. Let's say a million times brighter than Jupiter would be. Um, still hard to, see any, hard to see anything like a firefly. And so we cheat a little bit, not really cheating, we're just clever. Um, we look for planets that are brighter than Jupiter. Planets can't get much larger in radius than Jupiter, but I, did, I said we didn't understand planet formation, and we don't, but we understand what you start with, which is somehow big cloud of gas. We understand what you finish with, small planet, and the physicists in the audience will recognize that there's a change in potential energy between those two states. Big cloud of gas has a lot of potential gravitational energy, Small planet, a lot less gravitational energy. If that energy goes, some of it goes into the planet itself, it will heat up. When a planet collapses, when it forms out of bits and pieces, it gets really hot. Even now, when meteors smack into the Earth, they get really hot as they convert their gravitational energy into heat. And so right now, Jupiter has a temperature of about minus 200 degrees. When Jupiter was only a million years old or 10 million years old, it had temperatures of thousands of degrees. And so that will make it glow, and especially at infrared wavelengths, using the wonderful instruments that UCLA built, we can potentially detect that infrared glow. And so we started a project um, uh, basically here at UCLA. Ben Zuckerman, who's in the audience, was a, and In Suk Song were world experts in identifying young stars. If I'm going to see young planets, I better look at young stars. So Ben had a long list of all the young stars near the sun, very convenient. Um, Travis Barman, who was a postdoc here for a while, was an expert in extrasolar planets, and so he could say what they would look like, how bright they would be, what their characteristics would be. 
Christiane Marois, a postdoc who worked for me, was extremely good at image processing, at pulling the tiny little planet signal out of the telescope. And I was actually pretty good at going to telescopes and observing and, and planning programs like this. And then Eric was good at telling us what we were doing. Eric Becklin was good at doing, telling us what we were doing wrong and, and helping us to find a more proper um, um, technique. So we started a large-scale survey using the Keck telescope almost as soon as it came online. We refined it as we went along, and Ben got better targets. Christiane and I got better at the image processing and the observing techniques. But even from the beginning, looking at our bright stars, we saw little dots and got very excited and thought they were planets. But they weren't. They were faint, not because they were faint planets orbiting the star. They were faint because they were other stars very far away that happened to be in the background compared to the star, kind of photobombing our images of the stars. We found more of them, two of them, one there, one there around a double star, three of them there all at once, very convenient, except they were all background objects. Um, we looked at hundreds of these. I have an enormous catalog of background objects we produced over the years. By 2008, we're sort of on the verge of giving up, but Christian, my postdoc, young, enthusiastic, you know, we kept doing the observations and looking at stars, and he said he looked at a star and he found not one but two little dots next to it. Um, and I said, well, they're background objects, because they always are. And he said, there's two of them. Well, I said, if there's two, there have to be background objects, because we'll never be so lucky as to get two planets, two absolutely. It was Macintosh's law. Anytime there's two, they're background objects. It was the most wrong thing I've said in my life, I think, in a professional context. And we can talk about the math underlying why that was the most wrong thing later on. Um, they actually turned out to be our first real planets. And in fact, as we dug deeper, as we did imaging, there were four of them. So this is the, we don't get to give these things names. They just have serial numbers. The star's serial number is HRD799. It has four giant planets orbiting around it. The star is a little bit bigger than our sun. I may mention that in a theme later on. The planets are about five to seven times the mass of Jupiter from various lines of evidence. And they're young, so they're about 1,000 degrees in temperature. This one's a little bit fainter, about 900 degrees um, in temperature. But, but we actually made this work. Um, now, maybe making the narrative personal, another thing that was happening at the same time is my wife and I were expecting our first child. And a, a friend and colleague of mine knitted us a baby blanket that actually has the HR 7999 planets around it, except she knitted it before we published the fourth planet, so one of them is missing, sadly. But, but it's still a treasured possession, um, should be cited as point year 2010, because that's when she put it together. Um, watching the system since then, um, we've, of course, continued to observe it, and we can actually see the planets move. Let's see if I can get this movie to run. There we go. Movie put together by Jason Wang from data that Christian and I and others have taken. This is now approaching 10 years, slightly more, more like 12 years of observations of the planetary system. Pardon me, because I didn't loop it. And you can see them moving. This one moves slowly because it's far away. This one moves quickly. This one moves in between. The star is blocked out here. The light around it you're seeing isn't really the star. It's just lens flare that we couldn't get rid of perfectly. But the blobs are real. They're really the planets. And they're really obeying Kepler's laws just the same way Kepler said they would. And the fact that we can see Kepler's laws from the outside and watch them operate in kind of real time is one of the most amazing things I've seen in my scientific life. Um, slightly surpassed by someone else in the audience who's done the same thing with a giant black hole at the center of the galaxy and watched stars orbit around it obeying the same laws. And I'm particularly jealous because hers take, what's the shortest period one in the Galactic Center, Andrea? 12 years. 12 years. So she gets to watch it go all the way around. This is gonna take 800 years. I'm not gonna to get to see it go all the way around. This one is about 40, and so I'm trying to like eat well and exercise more so I can see it conclude an entire orbit. Um, a little bit of envy. I'm also trying to build better instruments so I can find a planet in here that would go around in 10 or 12 years. So we'll return to that. So we also had our press release, image of a glowing planet. Yay, very exciting, awesome. Um, uh, um, red because it looks more exciting now. It's probably actually purple, apparently, if you adjust the color to human eyes. Um, were we cheating? A little bit, but not completely. Because we can see these planets, we can do the spectroscopy thing. We can take the light from the planet and feed it into a spectrograph and measure its atmospheric composition. I won't go through the details of the spectrum, but a series of papers by UCLA um, connected people Travis Barman, when he was here, Quinn Konopaki, who was a UCLA graduate student now at UC San Diego, Jean Baptiste Rufio, who was my student at Stanford, and lots of other groups studying these planets. We see in their atmospheres things like bright infrared radiation from hot, thick clouds, probably of liquid metal deep in the planet's atmosphere. We see an absence of light because something's absorbing the light in here, 
due to things like water and hydrogen in the planet's atmosphere. Now, water, in this case, does not mean life. It's a temperature of 1,000 degrees. Water means superheated water vapor. And it's not a surprise, so we didn't actually say, yay, we found water, because we have dignity. But it's still pretty amazing that we can measure the, the composition. We can see carbon monoxide. We thought we would see methane, because that's what giant planets in our solar system have. And we actually didn't. And that, in turn, taught us a lot about the planet's um, that it maybe does look like this, that the planet has a thick layer of, of opaque clouds high up and then gaps in the clouds when you can see down into the hot interior. So most of the light you're seeing is coming from locations that are too hot for methane. And there's much more going on like circulation in the planet's atmosphere that we can infer. We can do chemistry on these planets. Cold high clouds of silicate. Overall, the composition actually doesn't quite look like Jupiter. It looks more like the sun, which might start to be a clue as to how they form. So by 2010, we start to have planets color-coded in direct imaging, but not as many as the transit people and the Doppler people, in part because it's hard, and in part because we can only really see planets in the equivalent of the outer parts of the solar system. We hadn't reached the Jupiter point that we wanted to get to. Because when you look with these adaptive optic systems, the stars are too bright. You're not quite getting to Jupiter or even Saturn levels of separation. And so actually before we started, before we made the discovery, we started working on what the next generation instrument should look like, something we called the Gemini Planet Imager. Gemini because it was going to go on a telescope called Gemini in Chile, Planet Imager because that's what it was built to do. It was a joint pro project. UCLA actually built the infrared spectrograph. It was designed not just to take images, but to take spectra of every planet that it sees. Um, Lawrence Livermore, where I was at the time, worked on the adaptive optic system, much more advanced than the generations we had at Keck. We had special masks called coronagraphs to block the star more effectively and let you see the planet, built by a team at the American Museum of Natural History. And then a group in Canada built an elaborate mechanical structure and really importantly, software that connected all the bits and let it operate routinely. And for scale, there's a, a Chilean fox. We put it together at UC Santa Cruz starting in late 2010. This is a clean room, not actually clean at the time, which is why the guy with beards are allowed in, but, but became a clean room so that we could successfully assemble it. The other note in the personal narrative is that's around when the baby we made the blanket for arrived, right around when we started integrating. Turns out to be hard to integrate an instrument when you have a newborn baby and you're driving from Palo Alto to Santa Cruz every day, but I, was, I survived, um, and helpful doggy. Um, this is the spectrograph that UCLA built. It's hard to tell in this light, it is extremely red. I think it was literally painted by a company that does sports cars. Um, so nice, it's the most, most visually exciting part of the instrument, lowered down into it. Um, when you're gonna put an instrument on a telescope, you wanna make sure it works even as the telescope tilts around. So in the end, we attached a crane to it tilted it back and forth and saw if anything fell off, and then when things did, we reattached them, and saw that it stayed aligned. The instrument has to line things up to a fraction of a millimeter, and it has to stay lined up no matter what orientation it is. It has to do that even when it's cold, so we built a giant meat locker around the instrument, chilled it down to minus five degrees to see, A, that the computers would still work, but B, that the contraction of the metal wouldn't cause it to drop out of alignment or more precisely, to measure that so we could compensate for that, which the system does. Survived all of this testing at Santa Cruz successfully, um, put it in a box, took about, partially due to the baby thing, um, about two years to do the, the full integration and testing of it. It's disconcerting to see all those years of work go into a box. Um, the somewhat larger child helped with the process of, of loading the box um, onto a truck. There's me saying goodbye to it um, before we sent it away. You can't drive to Chile, of course, um, but you can drive to an airport, and we sized the thing so it would fit in the cargo hold of a, a um, 787 or a 777, so it took a land flight down to Chile, trucked up to the Gemini Observatory, was unloaded and sat in their basement for a few weeks because sort of like an early, early Christmas present, they weren't ready for it. Then we went down and unpacked it, we started to bond with the Chilean wildlife. This is a Chilean a culpeo or a zorro, a Chilean fox that hangs around the observatory and, and wants people to feed it. Um, and I would, as I started to go down there personally and be away from my daughter more, I would take pictures of the culpeo to send back to her. And so she started to expect it and everybody on the team started to image it. And you can see it ended up being part of our, our um, project logo um, for that reason. There's me rebonding with the instrument after it got down there. There's the thing going on the back of the telescope. So this is the Gemini eight meter telescope. This is the planet imager being craned up, attached to the back of it. And we got it online 
Coming up on 10 years now, First Light in November 2013, the team including myself, Stephen Goodsell, who is our project manager from Gemini, Dave Palmer, real-time engineer. I, it, yeah, it would take forever to go through everybody, but a number of really awesome people. Jennifer Dunn, who wrote most of the high-level software. Marshall Perrin, also was at UCLA for a while, um, now at the Space Telescope Science Institute, responsible for chunks of the, the data pipeline. Um, and the fox looking over our shoulders. We spent about two nights, you always do this when you commission an instrument, you look at really boring things like stars because you know how bright they are, you want to see how efficient your instrument is so you measure a star and then you measure another star and then you measure another star and you get very bored and the project manager says your commissioning plans as you're measuring another 10 stars. On the third night the project managers went to sleep early um, and so I said we're going to look at a planet. They we're kind of okay with this, I should be fair. Um, we looked at a planet we knew existed. We looked at a, pl an, a directly image exoplanet that another group had found called Beta Pictoris b. In this image, the star is being blocked by our special masks, but it's kind of glinting around the edge of them. There's a little bit more lens flare close to it. These are not four planets. These are actually copies of the star that are made by diffraction on purpose to help us calibrate the instrument. One of the things you'll want to know when you do find a planet is how far from the star is it. Because these are copies of the star, the star is always at the intersection of the line joining these four. And because we calibrated carefully, we know that they're always two times 10 to the minus four brighter than the star. It lets us measure how bright the planet is. So those are calibrations. That guy's not, that's real. It's the planet we knew was going to be there. And so we, we expected it. We didn't quite have the software oriented right, so we're holding our laptops sideways and looking at other people's pictures and saying, is it that way? Yes, it was that way. Here's an image with a previous generation Gemini instrument a few years before we got there where the planet is and you can see that it's real. This previous generation instrument took about an hour to make that image and a huge amount of image processing afterwards. This is basically raw data off the back of the Gemini planet imager and it took about 60 seconds. And then if we took a whole half hour to look at it, we get something like that. So it did its job. It was much more sensitive than current generation instruments and so we were all very happy. Um, <laughs> including the, the Chilean fox. So on the basis of that, we started a large-scale exoplanet survey, working with our collaborators like Ben and Insuk, who had lists of the young stars we could see planets around. We targeted 600 stars in the end with weather we got about 534. Initially flying down to Chile, even pre-pandemic, eventually, as people do here, you start to observe remotely. You control the telescope from um, without getting on an airplane. It's much less exciting, but you're allowed to bring your dogs, so it can be a... a rewarding experience. Vanessa Bailey, who's now project scientist for a space telescope version of the technology I'm talking about at JPL. Eric Nielsen, who's now at New Mexico State University, and Percy and Hoku, um, who are helping with it. This is a movie of the survey. We're going to see 600 stars, a video that people on our team put together. We'll see where they are in the sky, and we'll see the GPI images of them all. If you watch carefully, you'll see some things go by. You'll see animation of the Gemini is a really cool telescope. Um, every so often you'll see rings or lines, and I'll talk about what those are. You probably won't see the planets in this fast in animation, um, but they're going to be there. S uh, if we observed a star more than once, we drew circles around it to indicate that we observed it again and again. And you might guess that because this one is, got observed eight times, it had something interesting. It's one of the ones that had an actual extrasolar planet around it. Um, before I talk about the planets, I'll talk about what those lines were, though, those rings that flash by almost too close to see you. Those aren't planets, those are asteroid belts. We can actually see asteroid and comet belts around other stars. Not the asteroids themselves, but the dust that they make when they collide with each other. Dust is really good at scattering light, it's got a lot of surface area per mass, and these systems have a lot of asteroids and comets, and so here you can see a ring of material surrounding this star. Most of these rings are kind of edge-on, not because there's something special that they all want to point at our solar system, but because they're easier to see that way, which actually tells you something about the properties of the dust particles, that they like to scatter light forward more than they like to scatter it sideways. So you're more likely to see a ring when the ring is almost but not quite pointed at you, as opposed to when it's surface on like this. And there's a nice paper by Tom Esposito. Almost all of these objects got, got papers, and there's a nice summary paper about what this tells us about the properties of the the asteroids, but I'm not the person to talk about that. I'm not really a dust person. Um, but I can talk about planets. The 51st, I'm trying to remember the order, it wasn't quite the 51st, but one of the very first stars we looked at, 51 Eridani, 
we found a little dot. And by this point, I was less cynical, and I thought maybe it really was a planet. And with the Gemini planet imager, we can actually tell, because we get a spectrum of it at the same time we get an image, and the spectrum looked like a planet. Spoilers, it really is a planet. The star is about 23 million years old, nice young star. The planet orbits roughly where Saturn does in our system. We're not quite Jupiter. Mass is about twice the mass of Jupiter, but it's the closest we've gotten in direct imaging. And its spectrum shows these big absorption blobs due to methane. The colored lines, the, um, uh, this line is sort of a previous extrasolar planet that doesn't look much like a planet. This line here is Jupiter. If you'd shown this to people, um, 60 years ago, they would have said, yeah, that looks like Jupiter. They would have said that looks like a planet. Its atmosphere is full of methane. The planet's young enough that it actually retains information about its initial entropy of formation. Its composition still looking a bit more sun-like than planet-like overall, maybe a clue to formation. And so, of course, we had our press release image, too, um, with the glowy cloud thing. And in fact, right now, we're working on models to figure out what surf fraction of the planet's surface is covered with clouds and how big the gaps are. All told with GPI, we saw um, six planets, including familiar looking ones like HRD 799, which were allowed to count. We made our list of targets blind without saying, oh yeah, there's a planet there, and we observed them with a piece of software that prioritized targets without cheating. And so we're allowed to count those for statistical purposes, not for discoveries or anything. And we also saw four of what are called brown dwarfs. A brown dwarf is an object in between a planet and a star. It might be 5% the mass of the sun, which would be 50 times the mass of Jupiter. Not quite big enough to sustain fusing hydrogen, but big enough to kind of have a good go at it before they give up and settle down into planet-like life. Um, because we can see all of these, we could make spectra, and so we have a library of spectra of different planets, from the hottest, whose spectra are kind of flat and boring, to the coolest, whose spectra are full of lots of detailed features. Um, Interesting to compare to the spectra of transiting planets that have been studied with Hubble and now James Webb, which tend to be a lot smoother and flatter. And also, this represents about 100 hours of time, excuse me, with the Gemini planet imager, this represents about 1,000 hours of time with the Hubble Space Telescope. So it's nicely complementary that we can probe different kinds of planets. And we found our compositions do tend to be more kind of sun-like. So again, maybe a clue, whereas the transiting planets have these weird compositions, that there are different pathways to forming close-in planets and far-away planets. We also tried to look at demographics. This is at the end of our survey, us and other people contributing more and more direct imaging planets, still not quite getting to Jupiter, and I'll talk about how we might get to Jupiter sometime in a little bit. Um, this is a, my last complicated plot. This is a plot of the sensitivity of the survey, and the color basically tells you how easy or hard it would be to find a planet of a given mass and, and orbital separation. Why is it easier or harder? Because not all our stars are equal. Some of the stars we looked at are very young, their planets are very bright. Some of the stars we looked at are older, their planets are fainter. So a planet like 51 Eridani, two or three Jupiter masses, you can see it around the young stars in our, youngest stars in our sample. You can't see it around the oldest stars in our sample. On the other hand, and that's represented down here, there's a, basically about 16 stars up to some statistical corrections around which we could have seen 51 Airy, the most Jupiter-like coldest planet we saw. Meanwhile, the brown dwarfs live up here. They have masses of 70 or 80 times the mass of Jupiter. They're so bright, you could see them around every star in the survey. So from this gr graph, that, which represents kind of the completeness of our survey, you can get an idea that although there's four brown dwarfs and six planets, the brown dwarfs were really easy to see. There's hundreds of stars you could have seen brown dwarfs around. You only got four of them. There's only about 10 or 20 stars you could see these lowest mass planets around, and we still got two of them. That's telling you that the low mass planets must be much more common. A larger fraction of our stars have these low mass planet-like objects. Similarly, you can only see close to the star, again, around the very best stars that happen to be close to us, not so much when they're far away, but there's still a couple of objects that are quite close to the star, and that's maybe telling you the closer to the star you get, the more planets you get. We do a more formal version of this with, with Markov Chain Monte Carlo statistical techniques in a really nice paper by Eric Nielsen and Rob DeRosa, um, and we come up with a few conclusions. When we combine our data sets with the data sets from the transit people and the Doppler people, we say that only about 25% of stars like the sun have giant planets and possibly less. 
So another way in which our solar system is actually a bit rare, we have Jupiter. Most solar systems don't have Jupiter. Is that important? No idea, but it's a way in which it might actually be important. I mean, non-facetiously, some people connect the evolution of life on Earth to Jupiter's interactions with comets in our solar system. We find that bigger stars have more giant planets. Most of the stars we found planets around are more massive than the sun. Kind of makes some intuitive sense that giant planets will be more common, but we can see that statistically. And then finally, tantalizingly, the Doppler people kind of measure out to here and see lots of planets. We measure into here and we see more planets as we get closer to the star. Probably most giant planets are around this 5 to 10 AU range where Jupiter is in our solar system. Also frustratingly, just inside our cutoff for where our instrument can actually um, hope to see things. There's where Jupiter would live. So we still don't have the sensitivity to get down to Jupiter even around our very best stars. The brown dwarfs up here, through various statistical tests, we can tell they're not part of the same population as the planets. They occur around different stars. They occur at different separations. Whatever made them is more like what makes stars than what makes planets. So there are distinct pathways. So we have tantalizing hints about these different planet formation pathways, but we kind of hit the limit of what the instrument would do. We also ran out of young stars to look at in the southern hemisphere, and the Gemini Observatory wants us off the telescope so they can go chase supernova or something like that. Um, fair enough. Um, and so we're rebuilding GPI into something that we are calling GPI-2. Um, uh, we're going to move from Chile to Hawaii. That will give us access to the northern hemisphere where there's lots of new stars we haven't looked at. Not as many, most of the young stars do turn out to be in the southern hemisphere, but a bunch that we haven't seen yet. Where there's a better sight in ways that matter, the atmosphere over Mauna Kea is better behaved. I have a backup slide I'll show about that because I think I'll have some extra time. Um, but in the process, we're not just going to move the thing. The instrument's 10 years old now. We're going to rebuild it. So we're going to put in faster computers. We're going to put in more sensitive sensors, not just for fun, but in ways that are motivated by the science we want to do. And I'll talk about the, that motivation and that science in a little bit. And I am not in charge of this, which is actually the best bit. Um, this is being led by former students and postdocs. Jeff Chilcote, who is a graduate student here, who's now at University of Notre Dame. Quinn with two N's, I'm glad she's not in the audience, Konopaki, who is a student of Andreas, who's now a professor at UC San Diego, Dimitri Savransky and Christiane Marois, who are my postdocs. One of the best things of reaching this point in your career is that other people get to do stuff and you get to sort of be the curmudgeon who, who gives them advice occasionally um, and stands up and does talks like this where they're really actually making the instrument work. And then finally, we'll update our logo um, because there aren't foxes in Hawaii, so this is a nene or a Hawaiian goose, which will be the new... Um, mascot for the creature, although we're not going to see those on the summit of the mountain, um, reasonably obviously. So what are the science goals for the GPI-2 upgrade? It's really pushing, to, one of them is to push down to here. So what do we need to do to push down to here? Um, let me move to my backup slide, unless I deleted it. Nope, didn't delete it. So I mentioned how our adaptive optic system works every millisecond. It makes a measurement of the atmosphere and then the formal mirror changes its time changes its shape every millisecond. It actually takes about two milliseconds, one millisecond to make the measurement, one millisecond for the computer to calculate the new shape, then the deformable mirror is in place. In two milliseconds, the Earth's atmosphere moves. Um, the low, atmos low altitude atmosphere doesn't move that much, but this is a map of high altitude winds of the jet stream. This circle is the Gemini South Observatory on Serapachan, and the damn jet stream pretty much aims at it, not every night, but a lot more often than we thought it would based on the models we use to design the instrument. And so those two milliseconds make a significant difference and are one of the main factors letting us not perfectly correct atmospheric turbulence. And so for GPI-2, we're gonna fix that in two ways. Um, we have a very nice paper by one of our students who actually went through the Global Forecasting System database um, um, and showed where the jet stream was and what direction it was going and how it correlated with our images um, really beautifully. Um, so GPI-2 first will move to Hawaii. There's less jet stream in Hawaii. It, it is less impacted by it. Second, we're just going to put a faster computer on. Computers have gotten faster in the intervening time. And so it'll run 2,000 times a second, and it will take about 100 microseconds to do the computation. So it'll always be keeping up with the atmosphere. We anticipate that combination might make it as much as a factor of 10 more sensitive in terms of how faint planets we can see. And we'll want to see closer, and so we're going to shrink our star-blocking masks with more intelligent designs 
that take advantage of diffractive properties of light to let you see very, very close to the star. We may not, I'm not going to promise Jupiter's, but there should be, in part, because even so, we'll still need the very youngest stars to be able to see Jupiter's, and there just aren't that many very youngest stars unless Ben has discovered more in the intervening time. But we can get closer, so we'll be able to increase our sample of planets significantly. We're pushing into where we think they are. And the second thing we're going to do is look at, at really baby planets. So 51 Aries is about 20 million years old. Its solar system is done forming planets for all practical purposes. We think the process of forming planets that we don't understand takes on the order of one to five million years for giant planets, give or take. So if you want to see a planet forming, you have to look at a star that's only a couple of million years old. The problem with um, young objects is that they're relatively rare. It's true for humans, too, for example, and because of that, they're further away. The distance from me to the nearest baby human is much larger than the distance from me to the nearest adult human because baby humans are rare and they tend to congregate in specific settings that are not lecture halls at universities. Similarly, baby stars are rare and they tend to congregate in different settings that are not the nearby solar neighborhood. So the stars that are forming planets right now are further away and fainter than the stars we looked at with GPI. And this was shown to us by our friendly arch rivals. The European Southern Observatory had a GPI-like instrument called Sphere. Very similar, there are ways in which we made different design decisions on bright stars we perform a little bit better. They were designed in part, though, to look at fainter stars. And so they can start to observe some of these baby stars. And their most spectacular image by far was of a planet or two that are actually forming. Boring serial number PDS-70. It's got one of these rings of asteroid or comet material, but embedded in the rings are two bright little lumps, which are almost certainly planets. And looking at them with a different telescope that's sensitive only to dust and gravel, basically, sort of pebble-sized objects, there's actually a little ring of dust around one of the planets. It's actually forming probably moons, not just a planet, even as we speak. This star is slightly too faint for GPI. We, after they found it, we tried, pushed the thing even with me in the room. We couldn't quite get there. The young stars, like I said, congregate in these star-forming regions. This is the Taurus molecular cloud. The stars are actually almost impossible to see because there's dust in the way. They're too faint for GPI. And so the other piece of GPI-2 upgrade that Quinconopaki is pushing is to look at fainter stars to make our adaptive optic system much more sensitive so that we can lock on to these young um, stars that might have baby planets. We'll also upgrade the sensitivity of the spectrograph because these planets will be further away and also presumably fainter. So even as we speak, it's getting put together. This is GPI growing up at University of Notre Dame. It took us, pandemic took us a while to get it out from Chile back into North America to do the rebuild, but it's happening right now. Also a bunch of bits are at UC San Diego where Quinn is building this new sensor that will allow us to observe much fainter stars. We're hoping to be on the telescope by the end of 24. And continuing the narrative, no longer driving um, pickup trucks. This is my now um, recently 12-year-old daughter um, interacting with a, a um, falcon. So concluding that, beyond that, the next next steps, I said I'd go to 2040. Um, over the next 10 years, I think we're going to learn a bunch of amazing things about giant planets, including with the James Webb Space Telescope, which is a whole theme I didn't have time to go into in this talk. But the step beyond that is Earth's. We want to look at their atmosphere and not see hydrogen and methane, but see oxygen, carbon dioxide, the signatures of Earth. Um, that is even harder. Compared to Jupiter, Earth is really tiny. Um, and as I said, we can barely see planets that are like Jupiter, except they're 1,000 degrees hot. We don't want to see Earths that are 1,000 degrees hot because they won't have life on them. And Earth cools off pretty quick. It didn't stay 1,000 degrees for very long. So we're going to have to look at them in the light they reflect, not the light they emit because of their heat. And that's not looking at a firefly next to a lighthouse. That's, this is a bioluminescent algae, one individual one of the ones you might get in those sort of luminescent tides. Literally seeing an Earth next to a nearby star is like seeing an individual bioluminescent algae next to a lighthouse that's pointed right at you. So challenging, but probably not impossible. And we're going to do it in two ways. So the last concept I have to introduce is, you know, where would you look? How close to the star do you look? We're looking for planets that we think will have liquid water on them. There's a very interesting discussion about how, again, that's kind of pre-Copernican, a view of how life has to exist. But it's also the kind of life that we can devise tests for. And so the focus in this is planets that have liquid water on their surface. How do you do that? You do that by not being too hot or too cold, not being too far from your sun. 
Venus in our solar system too hot, no liquid water. Mars in our solar system too cold, no liquid water. Maybe if it was a little bit bigger, it would have retained its liquid water longer. But you have to be the right separation from the sun in something we call the habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone. Around our sun, that's 1 AU. That's why we're here. Around other stars, it might be further or closer. And in particular, around fainter stars that give off less light, to have liquid water, you have to be closer to the star. You have to huddle up next to it for warmth because they're not giving off a lot of heat. And so this Goldilocks or habitable zone moves close to the star for low mass stars. These are little red stars. Far away for big stars, in between for us. And then, of course, the other reason we call it the Goldilocks zone um, is that of all the places in the solar system, it's the only one where you're likely to get attacked by a bear. Um, this is the most popular thing I ever did on Twitter, so I'm kind of obliged to, to show it to people. And so we'll probe this through two different techniques, um, different approaches. The planets in the Goldilocks zone of the low mass stars, again, there's a whole thread about studying these with James Webb that I'm not going to go into. With transit techniques, James Webb might be able to probe some of them. We can also probe them with imaging. They're still the same brightness as the Earth. They're getting the same amount of sunlight the Earth does. But their star is a lot fainter because they're orbiting low mass stars. And so instead of being 10 billion times fainter than the star, they're only 100 million times fainter than the star. They're like a whole clump of bioluminescent algae. Challenging, but not unimaginably challenging. What is unimaginably challenging is they're really close to the darn star because they're huddled up next to it for warmth. To see something really close to a star, how close you can get to the star is almost completely determined by how big your telescope is. And so to see little planets close to little stars, we're going to need really big telescopes. It's beyond the reach of Keck. It is in the regime of the next generation, things like the proposed 30-meter telescope the University of California is part of. And in fact, one of the signature science cases for these extremely large next-gen telescopes is to put something like the Gemini Planet Imager on them, but on a bigger telescope, you'll be able to see into that Goldilocks zone around the most nearby stars. As long as it's 100 bioluminescent algae, not one bioluminescent algae. On the Earth, even with the Gemini Planet Imager, we won't be able to do this for sun-like stars. The sun-like stars are so bright, they'll still swamp the planet when you see them from the Earth. So up here, you're 10 billion times fainter than the star, but you're a little bit further away. So you don't need a 30-meter telescope. What you need is finally to get rid of the atmosphere. And so the other piece of this will be to put an instrument like the Gemini Planet Imager on a telescope in space where there's finally no atmosphere, even at 2,000 times a second, not enough to keep up with the atmosphere, even at 10,000 times a second. Even at the laws of physics limits, you can't see through the atmosphere to a, to a true Earth analog. And so we need to put telescopes in space. So there are concepts out there. Um, Tommaso mentioned I was on the Astro 2020 Decadal Survey. We considered this. We were presented a range of telescopes that were designed, not like James Webb, but from the ground up to look for Earth-like planets as their signature science case, ranging from 4-meter telescopes to 8-meter telescopes to even concepts for 12-meter telescopes. I have an awesome video of that. Um, again, if there's time at the end. We sort of settled on a six meter telescope, something like the James Webb sized, because the planets are far enough away that you don't need a 30 meter, but um, designed from the ground up to do the exoplanet imaging as their signature science case. And there's a bunch of design trades that go into doing that. And we believed and still believe that we can actually build this. Um, the design studies had names like LUVOIR for Large Ultraviolet Optical Infrared Telescope. NASA very sensibly has decided it's hard to sell that, and so it now has a name. It's called the Habitable Worlds Observatory, and it was the number one recommendation for space of this decadal survey. The next, next big thing we do in space, after Webb, after a telescope called Roman, should be this. And we believe, and I believe, because I was the person in the room who understands this technology best, that we know how to build this. We have the technological expertise to build a planet that could look at a solar system and not see four giant planets like HRD 789, but Earths and Neptunes and Venuses, and make a spectrum that doesn't show water vapor or carbon monoxide, but that actually shows little absorption features that turn out to be due to oxygen in the planet's atmosphere, what we call bio biomarkers, biological markers, <coughs> indicating the presence of Chilean foxes, or more accurately, of plants, because that's what makes the oxygen. 
We know how to build this. It'll probably take till the mid-2040s, so that this is the thing that my, my graduate students now will get to do, but it's something we can do, something that we have the knowledge. In between, we have the 30-meter telescope. We know how to build its version of GPI to see the Earth that are close to the little stars and to study a whole plethora of planets. So it's an astonishingly exciting field, and I'm, I'm happy now to be part of the, the people who are going to enable this for the next astronomical generation, and I'm very happy to be back here and, and give this talk. So thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Bruce. We have time for a little Q&A. If people have questions for Bruce, I'll happy to moderate those. Uh, questions? You were very clear. Lots of <laughs> ben? Uh, how many of the stars in the southern hemisphere have you looked at? How many stars with Gemini have you looked at with Gemini South and how many you look at when you move the telescope to Gemini? Gemini South, we looked at 534 stars. We targeted 600, but the weather got bad. Um, honesty compels me to admit, and, and, and Ben under, probably understands this extremely well, by the time we were hitting star 400, they were kind of boring. We, we were smart, so we did them in order. We looked at the youngest, closest ones first. Most of the statistical power of the survey came from the first 300 or 200 stars. And so in the north, we're going to do a smaller survey, probably on the order of 100 to 200 stars. We will repeat some. So we have modeling tools. Once we know for sure what our sensitivity is, which we won't know until we observe, we have modeling tools that can calculate, are you better looking at a completely new star where there could be anything, or looking at a star where you know there are no big planets, but you could have missed the small planets. And so our target optimizer will make those decisions for us. I expect we will repeat the the best ones, the young association stars that are, that are sort of equatorial and at reasonable air masses, will observe slightly older stars having more contrast sensitivity will let us, we could see three or four Jupiter mass planets around 200 million year old stars. So we'll do more of those as well. Open our argument about whether we do the Hyades again. The, the Hyades cluster is a cluster of 600 million stars in the solar neighborhood. It was my PhD thesis, thanks to Ben and Eric. I completely failed to find anything interesting in it when I studied it. Um, and so I have mixed feelings about inflicting that on the next generation of students, but it might be a good target for, for GPI. So, so the, the Young Association survey will be on the order of 1 to 200, including some repeats. And then there'll be a separate survey of these baby stars, probably about 50 of those or so. Um, that are slightly further away. Any other questions for any other questions for Bruce? Just a yes. Comment. Yeah. Um, it, it's wonderful that, that uh, but this is more than fascinating. But it's got to be communicated to people out there so they quit quibbling over small matters. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, 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 there's, if you can can share this. That's one of the reasons I like things like that movie. I mean, there's been about you know, a million plus YouTube views, uh, variations on that movie. Just the fact that you can see other planets orbiting around, that, that we can communicate some of this in ways that, that, that are understandable. But I completely agree. I mean, that, that's why we get to do astronomy, because people care about it and find it interesting. And communicating it is, is a really important part of our job. Yeah, we have a question there in the back. I think we will. I think the, especially in exoplanets, the results that have been shown so far, I have a whole separate public lecture on James Webb, early release science, that you're welcome to Google on YouTube. Um, uh, they targeted the easy ones first. So they're nice giant planets. They got good demonstration results. But, but on purpose, they picked ones that they knew would work. So Webb, particularly with transits, is Webb is OK at direct imaging, and I'm part of groups that are going to use it. But, for transits, it's going to be beautiful. And so it will push down to 
Earth-sized planets through and measure their atmospheric composition. Very few of those will be in the Goldilocks zone. That's right on the edge of Webb. And it wasn't designed to do this. Webb was designed when we didn't even know there were extrasolar planets, practically. Um, but it will get better and better, like you say, as they do this calibration, as they understand the software. Um, they'll be a bit in the other direction, especially for direct imaging. The, how perfect and stable the mirror is is very important. Right now, the mirror is actually, the individual pieces of James Webb are aligned to a tiny fraction of the size of a bacteria, I think is the usual metaphor. Um, and they're actually getting better. The telescope is still kind of, it's like something cooling as it comes out of the fire, except it's cooling down to minus 200 degrees. So it's kind of going pop, pop, every so often pring, like some piece of hot metal. And so every so often, one of the mirrors moves, and then Marshall Perrin and other people move it back. Um, it's settling down, it's not doing that as much, and that will make it even more stable for this particular kind of science. Galaxy people like Tommaso don't care that it's going prang, prang, prang all the way. Although I think they get, very, they get very irritated when we point at our stars because they're very bright and they leave after images on the telescope for weeks. They're learning, so that's another thing they're fixing. They're learning, don't look at the tiny galaxy after you've looked at the bright star, do it the other way around. Um, so when it's settled and we have calibration, it'll be really good. A slightly worrying thing that we don't know how worrying yet is that it got pranged by a meteor. Very tiny meteor. Micro, I mean, it, gets, it was expected to get pranged by micrometeors. One of them hit a little harder than anyone expected. You can actually see the effect of that on things like high contrast imaging. Um, not in a devastating way or anything like that, but in a way that will worry me a little for the future Earth-like telescope. And so we may have to put a tube on the telescope to protect it from micrometeorites. James Webb, they've actually decided they're only going to point backwards. So as it moves through the solar system, it's going to look backwards so that as it moves through clouds of micrometeorites, they won't hit the mirror. They'll hit the back of the mirror. So, so we're learning a lot. Um, and I'm incredibly, yeah, the, the people who, yeah, mine I can fix when it breaks. I can't imagine how stressful it is to have it um, two million miles away. Any other questions for Bruce? Yeah, yeah but Eric? Yeah. We don't have a good, it's not so much just the seeing, the, the R naught, it's the time scale, the atmospheric coherence time. And we anticipate that's probably about a factor of two to three, and then the faster computer is another factor of two to three on the very brightest stars in contrast performance. So they're roughly equally important. Then for the, for the limiting magnitude going down to fainter stars, that's mostly better detectors. Our, our current CCD that we use to sense atmospheric turbulence has about five electrons of noise. We're going to move to a zero electron sensor, and we're going to use it in a better sensor design, something called a pyramid sensor. So that should buy us about three magnitudes in guide star magnitude limitation, which is enough to get into Taurus and, and regions like that. So fingers crossed we'll learn when we, when we get there. But. Anyone? I think there was one more in the... Uh, yeah, over oh. there. Has there been an increase in seeing UFOs more than... You can see a lot deeper into space, a lot clearer yeah. now, like all the, the, the talk about, like on YouTube now lately. That seems like that's a big deal going on on Earth, all over, all these sightings. How is it looking from when you're looking through a telescope like that? Is there a lot of sightings there as well? So it's a... Obviously a complicated question that there's a range of, of opinions on, but one thing about telescopes is they look at a tiny piece of the sky. It's like looking through a soda straw. And so one lesson, if you want to look for something that's rare, like some unexplained phenomenon, is you're better off looking over a very wide area um, with lots of, of big, wide, little cameras as opposed to a telescope that looks deeper. So for any rare object, whether it's in our solar system or in our atmosphere or not, um, the kind of telescope we use is not a good choice to find it. It's, it's really, you know, there has to be something at the end of the soda straw, and rare objects, whatever their nature, don't tend to be in those. So those are more going to be discoveries from the telescopes that are designed as, as wide-angle lenses that can cover huge amounts of the sky rather than what we do. Any more questions for Bruce? All right, then, uh, you know, before we conclude, we would like to present... Bruce, uh, the award, you know, the Musa J. Arman Award for Innovation 
let's see if I can open this box. I'm not an ex experimentalist, so let's see. I can help. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, I know. I have, fortunately, nobody asks me to build anything with my hands, so that's good. All right. So, yeah. Uh, okay, so. So you are. So. Other previous recipients of this award were the CERN Council President, Elise Rabinovich, Stuart Parkin from the IBM Research Center, Terence Sajowski, the Franz Crick Chair at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies, and President of the Neural Information Processing System Foundation, and many more. So thank you. We're very pleased to have you to this distinguished role, and thank you for coming here, and we, we, we love your colloquium. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much.